So, good afternoon. So, now we have the second lecture on algebraic topology. So, we had uh, introduced uh, uh, singular homology. So, that uh, means we had, uh, so we'd introduced uh, chain complexes. Um, so we, that means one has some maps, Cn plus 1 goes with D to Cn, goes to, with D again to Cn minus 1, and so on. <coughs> and then we had uh, uh, defined the homology of such a chain complex. So, uh, so we had Hcn of C star would be the n cycles divided by the n boundaries where uh, Zn of C is the kernel of D uh, from uh, Cn to Cn plus 1, n minus 1, and uh, Dn is the image. Uh, to make this a chain complex, we need that D composed with D is always zero, which precisely means that uh, this image will always be contained in the kernel, and this definition makes sense. And for the singular homology, we had uh, defined this chain complex by making Cn of x, where as a, x is to a topological space, to be uh, formal sums, sum sigma, a sigma times sigma. So this is a finite sum. Um, a sigma is an integer. So finitely many of the a sigma are non-zero. And uh, the sigma is a singular n simplex, so a map from the standard n simplex to x, a continuous map. And then we have defined some uh, differential on that, and the cohomology is the uh, is the homology of that. And we were now. Uh, considering, uh, I mean, trying to prove that this is a, uh, in invariant, uh, so that um, this behaves nicely for continuous maps. So, <clears throat> um, and for this, we had first uh, looked at it more abstractly again in this context of uh, chain complexes. So if uh, C star D and D star D are chain complexes, then we had defined a chain map F star from uh, C star to D star is uh, a map at all levels, so is given by, say, Fn from Cn to Dn for all n, uh, such that it commutes with a differential. So if we have this map, so this is Fn, this is Fn minus 1, this commutes. So if you go this way, this way, you get the same as if you go the other way around. Okay, and uh, we had seen that if we have such a chain map, 
then we get an induced mass on homology. So if um, F star from C star to D star is a chain map, then we have a map which I call also F star from Hn of C star to Hn of D star uh, is the induced map which is given by if I take the class in homology of a cycle uh, alpha in the end of C, then this is just mapped to the class of F star alpha. Or if you want, yeah, Fn alpha if you want. OK, and this is where we were. And now uh, we want to apply this to um, to show that homology is functorial. So compatible with continuous maps. So this is uh, the following result. So, well, first we want to define the push forward map. So let f from x to y be a continuous map. Well, you know, there's an obvious way how you can make out of um, a sim singular simplex in x a singular simplex in y just by composing with f. So we, if um, if sigma from delta n to x is an n simplex in x, then f, I mean, I don't know what this definition is, f composed with sigma, obviously from delta n to y is an n simplex in y. And obviously, we can use this to define uh, a push forward map on uh, cycles, on, um, on the singular chain complex. But just so we define Fn from um, C star of x to C star of y in the obvious way. Namely, if we have a cycle here, this is of the form sum sigma, where sigma runs through the n simplices, the singular n simplices in x, a sigma, which is an integer, times sigma. Well, if you want to apply fn to it, the only thing we can do is we apply it in some sense to sigma, but the way we apply it to sigma is by composing. R sigma times F composed with sigma. Okay, and this obviously is a map and it's straightforward to see. So if you want an easy exercise, well, it's not even an exercise, it's trivial. Uh, this is, if I, we have this F star given by the Fn, is a chain map. Uh, from C star of X to C star of Y. Because obviously it's compatible with taking differential. If you remember the definition of B. So thus we have a push forward homomorphism. Uh, so So this is a chain map. So um, thus, there is a map with 
a group homomorphism Fn, F star, from the nth homology of x to the nth homology of y. So F was a continuous map, um, which is given precisely as the, uh, you know, as we had the induced map on homology for chain homomorphism, because if we apply, uh, namely, if we have a cycle alpha, this is mapped to Fn of alpha. So the class of the cycle alpha is mapped to the class of Fn of alpha. So if you want to write explicitly class of some uh, A sigma times sigma is mapped to class of some sigma A sigma times F composed with sigma. Okay, and this, so F star, and this is true for all N. And F star is called the push forward. F. So thus we have uh, now associated to every topological space a sequence of groups and to each uh, continuous map between topological spaces a, um, a, a homomorphism of these groups. So we somehow see that things start start translating into algebra. So uh, we can see that also by definition. If uh, f from x to y and g from y to z are continuous maps, Uh, then, if I take the push forward by the composition, this is the composition of the push forwards. And this is completely obvious from the definition because you know this is just given by composing with uh, with the map. So if you, you know, compose with a composition, you compose twice. Okay, so this is. And it's also obvious if we take the identity on X. So with this one X, I mean just the map, it sends every point of X to itself. So, so let so one X from X to X be the identity on X. Map on X. Then clearly. The push forward by the identity is the identity. Now, this is also if you compose with the identity, you get the same thing. Okay, so this uh, this is usually what one says that uh, if one knows the language, that the uh, homology is a functor from uh, topological spaces from the category of topological spaces to the category of groups or being groups, whatever. So, <clears throat> but uh, you know, we will not use this language, but we can use a simple corollary that homology is invariant under homeomorphism. So if um, so if f from x to y is a homeomorphism, 
so a continuous projective map which has a continuous inverse, then it follows that the push forward by f from hn of x to hn of x is an isomorphism of groups for all n. And this is uh, obvious from what I wrote here. I spell it out. So uh, if um, so f is a homeomorphism, so we have uh, the inverse homomorphism f to the minus 1. So we have the identity on the enthomology of x is, uh, you know, as we know, as I just wrote there, the push forward by the identity on the enthomology. Now, you know, we have f on f to the minus 1. So if we first apply f and f to the minus 1, we get the identity. So this is the same as the push forward by f to the minus 1 composed with f, which is f to the minus 1 star composed f star. So what this says is that, uh, <coughs> so we find that this composition is the identity on the homology. And obviously, the other way around, we also get that the identity on the homology of y, so similarly, the identity on the homology of, y, on the homology of y will be f star composed with f to the minus 1 star. So thus, we find that indeed f star is an isomorphism with inverse the push forward by the inverse. OK, so this is uh, completely standard. OK, now we want to finally compute the homology in one example, and precisely in the simplest example that exists, which is one point. Okay. So it's kind of comfort. I mean, until now, we have this rather complicated definition. But uh, you know, we haven't computed any case at all. So we want to compute the most trivial thing we can imagine, which is a point, for example. So let uh, say point uh, be the space. So point be the space consisting of a single point. It's a set with one element. Obviously, this has the unique topology in which this point is both open and closed. <coughs> so, <coughs> so now we want to compute the homology of this wonderful, wonderfully complicated space. So, uh, so f well, first, you know, there are not very many maps from any space to a point, namely always one, which maps everything to that point. So whichever space you have, the only map from that to a point is the map which sends every point of the other space to this given point. So for all n, there exists, there is a unique map which I maybe call uh, sigma n from delta n to the space. Uh, Maybe I call this whatever. Um, so which sends, uh, namely the constant map. Any x here is sent to this point. And this uh, map I call sigma n. It's just a constant map. So from this, we already we can already compute uh, what this chain 
complex is, what the singular change is. So we get C n of x is uh, the set of all linear combinations of all possible maps from sigma n to point. So this just means all multiples of this one map. So this is just z times uh, sigma n. Okay? So this is cn of x is isomorphic to z. Well, the elements of it are a times sigma n, where a is in z. And uh, so for all n. And what is the differential? So if I take d of sigma n, then we have to recall the definition of d, which I did not repeat at the beginning of the lecture. But how did it go? This is sum i equals 0 to n minus 1 to the i, sigma n composed with this map E0. We leave out i. So if we have a, this is a, a map from delta n minus 1 to delta n, which sends the, you know, the, uh, the linear combination of the E0 to E n minus 1 for the corresponding linear combination of E0 to E n, where a i the i does not uh, do that. Okay, <coughs> and what is this? Well, this composition, whatever it is, is always sigma n minus one because this is the only map that exists from delta n minus one to uh, x. So this is just an alternating sum of sigma n minus ones, and so this will be uh, depending on whether this number is even or odd. Sometimes plus and minus cancel each other out. Sometimes they don't. So this will be 0 if n is odd, hopefully. <coughs> or if n is equal to 0, because uh, you know, the map, you know, this is just, you know, the, the D, this was just trying to be 0. In case n is equal to uh, n is equal to minus, I mean, if you have this, it's just not there. If n is equal to zero, and so we don't have anything at all. And the other case, it is just if you look it up, sigma n minus one. If n is even and different from zero. Or maybe n bigger than zero. And I could also say, you know, in principle. Okay, so you know here you can just see if you see if it's even, there one remains. They all cancel each other out, but one. Well, so what does it mean? Well, so if you look B n of point, so I claim that this means if I take the boundary, the singular boundaries, this is equal to the. For n bigger than zero, because uh, you know whenever uh, so this this map is will be either in the even case it will be subjective, but then the next map is zero because you or it is uh, or it's the other way around. So in every case, the the boundaries are precisely the cycles. If you just look at what this gives, so there's always one zero map, and then in, in, uh, uh, basically the identity from z to z alternating. And in the case n equal to zero, we <coughs> actually find that we start, so C zero is z, but the map is zero. So uh, the uh, the Zn is, is z times sigma 0, but it's not the boundary. So we have that, but um, B0 of point is equal to 0, z0 of point is equal to z times sigma 0. So thus it follows. So the result, therefore, is that the 
cohomology of a point is equal to 0 if n is different from 0 and z times sigma 0 or just z if n is equal to 0. So we have uh, succeeded in computing the homology of this uh, very central space. So you just have to, to look what this means and see the opposite. What? Uh, one has uh, epsilon What? One has this homology epsilon zero. So one has epsilon zero. No, I just can you. What does H zero B zero? That doesn't make sense. I mean, what can you just say? Maybe you formulate it in a different way so that I can understand. Uh, I say uh, H zero is a homology. Yeah. What, what does it measure? What does it measure? Yeah. Okay. So, um, so the question is, H zero is uh, the zero homology. What does it measure? And uh, you are. Very lucky because that's precisely the next result that we are doing because the H0 is always Z to the number of path components of the space. So in this particular case, a point has one path component and uh, so H0 therefore is Z. And that is precisely what we do as a next step. So this is, um, so I'm kind of lucky. So uh, anyway, so this is, uh, so the answer to the question is the following. So first, so this is uh, slightly more general. So if xk, k is the set, so let xk, k be the set of path components, say of, yeah, path components of a topological space x. So, you know, we say that, you know, if you have a topological space, we say that two points are in the same path component if you can connect them by a path. So map from an interval to uh, x. And they are in different path components if, uh, you know, you cannot, like here. Um, then the first statement is that the homology of x for all x is just the direct sum of all the homologies of the path components. Okay, so... Just have a, if you have a, well, it's kind of obvious so that elements in the homology of X are just uh, sums of elements in the path components. If, the, you know, if you have a K, if you have, say, two path components, X1 and X2, then the nth homology of X is the nth homology of X1 plus the nth homology of X2. But in principle, it also holds if you have infinite many components, but you don't have to worry about that too much. And the second statement is that if X is path connected, then the zero homology is just Z. Or isomorphic to Z. So in particular, particular answering your question, so it follows that uh, if uh, X has, uh, uh, say, K path components, uh, then H0 of X is isomorphic to Z to the K. So we can really say that the zero homology measures precisely the path components. The path components it just measures uh, how far 
x is away from being path connected. And so the way how one finds out anything about connectedness properties of uh, I mean path connectedness of spaces by homology is decided by computing the zeroth homology. Okay. So this has um, So we have these two parts. So the first one is in some sense trivial. I only have to see whether I can convince you of it. So proof. Well, you know, you know, we have this n simplex delta n, which is a simplex in R n. So certainly it is path connected. It's actually a contractible space. Um, so if uh, sigma from delta n to x is a singular n simplex, you know, then it's the image of the path connected space by a continuous map. So then the image is path connected. So it's path connected and therefore it lies in one connected component of X. And um, so furthermore, if we take, uh, you know, d sigma, then uh, so all the, then this is a linear combination of uh, n minus 1 simplices, of singular n minus 1 simplices, which lie in the same path component as uh, is uh, So where uh, image where uh, sigma composed is, uh, um, is a singular simplex in the same path component of X. So if then we write X as uh, the region of xk, where the xk are the path components, then we see that every singular simplex lies in one of the xk. So if you have a, a chain, it's just a direct sum of change in each of the xk's. And the differential just sends something which lies in xk to something that lies in xk. So we get that c star so C so it follows that C n of X is just a direct sum over all K of the C n of X K. The D respects this uh, summation. So if something lies in C n of X K, then D of it lies in C n of X K. So it follows that also this is true for Z n and dn. Uh, that would be not so n of xk. And then as the homology is the quotient, you know, we get that the homology of x is equal to the direct sum of the homologies of the path components. So <clears throat> maybe a little bit fast, but it's really uh, trivial. You know, after all, uh, <clears throat> uh, 
singular chain is just a you know, a formal sum of simplices and each of the simplices has to lie uh, in one of the path components and everything is just a direct sum. So now we come to the second part which is more interesting. Um, so we want to see that uh, the zero homology is Z. So we will, you know, we have to somehow construct an isomorphism. Uh, and so how do we do that? So for any point P in X, I write by abuse of notation, if you can handle it, and if not, then I have to change it. Uh, I write P also for the map from delta N to uh, X, which sends all points here to the same point P, so the constant map. So I've just called the constant map that sends everything to P, also just P. So this should not lead to, lead to confusion, but if it does, you tell me. Okay. So on the other, so if you have a point, say X in X. Uh, And now the point is called x. Well, anyway, so let's say for point P and x. Um, let me see. So we, let's, we choose a point, say, x0 in x. Okay. Now we have our x. Here's maybe we have any point P. Here we have x0. Then, you know, X is path connected, there will always be a path connecting them. So, so for uh, P in X, let say sigma P from delta 1, which is nothing else according to our definition and just the interval 0, 1, to X be a path, so we choose a path from x0 to p. So this path here is sigma p. Then if you uh, remember the definition of the differential, the differential of this thing is P minus X0. So the constant map P minus the constant map X0. So then, by definition, you know, if you look what the differential means, you know, in this case where you just have a one, you just, there are just two points, the beginning point and the end point, and the differential is the end point minus the beginning point. So the definition is uh, D from sigma P is equal to P minus X0. So this is, uh, so for every path, we get that the differential of the path is just this difference, this formal sum. So now we define a homomorphism uh, epsilon from the zero chains of X to Z. which is, you know, if we have a zero ch chain, this is a formal sum 
I am maybe I call them P. So I take the points A P times P. Uh, no, this P is the you know the singular is this map. So ah yeah, I actually don't need that. I just take this. It's just it's a very constant map. It's just a map which sends the point to P. So that's the way I want. I didn't want it for all n, but just for n equals to zero. Sorry for that. So maybe I can repeat. So I, you know, that was a, so the, we define the P to be the map which sends the one point that this thing has, which is the point zero, to P. Okay. So, you know, somehow it's kind of quite reasonable to identify the map which sends one point, you know, the one point of this thing to one given point with this point because that's precisely the information that it contains. So, and then, uh, so this was our P. And now, given a point, we find uh, that uh, uh, given a we can make a path to any given point, and the differential of uh, the path viewed as a one chain is precisely the difference, the, the point minus uh, uh, the kind of base point we chose. Now we define this homomorphism. So if we have this, we just sum, we just take the sum of the coefficients. Now by definition, a chain is a, such a finite such sum, so only finitely many of the AP, which are integers, are non-zero. So this makes sense. It's a finite sum of integers. So now we want to prove that the homology is isomorphic to Z. So we know that every element in C0 is also a cycle because it, you know, the differential to the next level is by definition 0. No? Because we, below 0, everything is 0. So this is also the same as C0 of X. So then the claim is. that um, the kernel of epsilon is equal to um, B0 of x. And um, note that this proves part two. It proves two because epsilon is obviously surjective. You know, we can write down anything. We can get whatever number we want. We just take one point and take any coefficient. And then we get that coefficient. So the map is certainly surjective. And if we have, um, we have a map from V0 of x, to Z, which is surjective, and this kernel is precisely this. So it means it's an isomorphism. It gives an isomorphism of Z of the quotient of V0 by V0. Um, Z0 of X. I just divide by V0 of X with the map induced by epsilon to z. Well, this is whatever, the homomorphism theorem. Also. And after all, this thing is h0 of x. OK, so we just have to prove this claim. Well, you know, if you have to prove that two sets are equal, you have to prove both inclusions. So that's what you learn. So let's try both inclusions. So let's take, say, an element equal to some P AP times P. Be an element in the kernel of epsilon. So then we have to show that it is a boundary. 
that is d of something. Well, that's quite simple because we can write it like that. So this is certainly alpha. But we can also, you know, the sum of all the ATs is zero. That's precisely what means it's in the kernel of epsilon. So we can add zero to this thing. It's still the same thing. No? Because this thing is actually zero. But now we see if we look at uh, this thing, this is just the differential of uh, this. So this is equal to the sum over OT, AP, times the differential of sigma P, which is the same as the differential of sum AP <coughs> sigma P. So we see this is indeed a boundary. So, and the other direction is even slightly easier, I think. So if, say, sigma from, again, delta 1 to x is a, a singular one simplex, which is the same as a path. Then what? Well, obviously, we have that, uh, by what we wrote here, that um, the differential of sigma is, uh, you know, sigma of 1 minus sigma of 0. This is precisely what it says. If it is a path from sigma of 1 to sigma of 0, its differential is this. No? So in particular, so I mean maybe uh, to be sure, if I write something like this in the other notation, this means uh, you could, you know, like here, you could also write this plus minus this. No? So this is what it means no, as a linear combination. Also here I could say this is this plus minus 1 times this. So that's what this notation means, like it means in, you know, in high school mathematics. <coughs> so in particular, if we take epsilon of d sigma, then this is uh, the sum of the coefficients. Here the coefficient is 1, here it's minus 1. So this is 1 minus 1 equal to 0. So if you have any cycle, so if alpha is equal to some sigma uh, a sigma times sigma is a one cycle, is a one uh, chain, then, and we take the differential, then uh, so epsilon of d alpha is equal to epsilon of some sigma a sigma times d sigma. And you know, epsilon is also you know, just uh, linear, so it goes in here. So this is some sigma a sigma times epsilon of d sigma. And we know that for every uh, one uh, simplex, epsilon of d sigma is equal to zero. So this is just the sum of zero. OK, so we see uh, this inclusion. So we have that uh, indeed uh, v0 of x is contained in the kernel of epsilon. OK, and so this proves uh, this proposition. OK, so now um, okay, so much about this. So we have at least found out what the zero homology computes. 
and we have uh, been able to compute uh, the homology of a point. <coughs> so uh, now we want to come to the first uh, theorem in this, uh, in this lecture. So the first time one really has to make some effort. So until now, I mean, I expect you have to, had to make quite a lot of effort to, I mean, because there are so many definitions that one has to deal with. But, the, you know, there are lots of definitions. It's difficult to keep them in one's head. But the things that we do with the, with the definitions are completely trivial. It's maybe difficult to notice because there are so many, you know, everything is new. But now we want to do something where one actually uh, needs an idea. And so this is the homotopy invariance theorem. So it might be that the proof is actually not more difficult to follow than the other proofs. But if you, you know, these, if one gives you all the definitions and you understand them and tells you what the result should be, you can prove it as an exercise. But this one is not an exercise. So the homotopy invariance theorem. So we want to show that homology groups are homotopy invariants. So what does it mean? So first I recall to you about homotopy. I mean, you have had it very recently, but I need to also set up and also fix the notation. So definition. So I write uh, now also I for the interval 0, 1. Uh, so let f and g be continuous maps from between two topological spaces. So uh, homotopy, uh, homotopy uh, f from I write it just like this, from F to G is a continuous map F from which we want the one X times I to Y such that if I restrict to uh, to the part of I where this one is zero, I get F. If I restrict to uh, the point here being 1, I get G. So I write it in a slightly different way because I want to use this notation in the proof. So such that if I take the map I0 from X to X times I, which sends uh, X to uh, X comma 0, and I1 corresponding thing on the other side. If I have these two maps, uh, so for these maps, for these maps, we have that f is equal to large f composed with i0, just means the same as saying I restrict to x times 0. Um, and G is equal to F composed with I1. So this is a homotopy, and you have learned that it's, uh, before. So if we have a homotopy, we call the two maps homotopic. So if there is a homotopy, f from f to g, uh, we call f and g homotopic. And as we are at it, I introduce a few other words that you already know. So to say what it means to be homotopy equivalent and then as a special case, contractible. 
fact, you have, you know, you have learned all this, no? I, mean, this, I don't know who taught you Zimmermann or, uh, or Billigas, but anyway, you know, just I want the notations on the table. So, so two topological spaces, X and Y, are called homotopy equivalent. So, and if there are maps which are inverse to each other up to homotopy, so if they are continue, if there are continuous maps, I hope that's correct, f from x to y, g from y to x, such that if I first go from x to y and then go back, this is homotopic to the identity on x. And if I do it the other way around, is homotopic to the identity on y. And um, I call, uh, if x is homotopy equivalent to a point, I say it's contractible. So to the space which I called point, so a point, uh, we call X contractible. There's somehow a homotopy which contracts the whole of X to a point. So and now we want to prove this theorem that if two maps are homotopic, then they induce the same map on homology. Okay, we have, uh, if we, we know that if we have a continuous map between topological spaces, it induces a homomorphism on the homology group. And now the statement is that which map they induce depends only on the homotopy class of the map. So this is the, we were stated here, theorem. If x and y are, no, it was wrong one. So let f and g from x to y be homotopic. Then if I take the push forward map by f, then it is equal to the push forward map for g you know, which, you know, as a homomorphism from Hn of x to Hn of y. Okay, so homotopic maps give the same map on homology. You have some easy So, so in some sense, it says that uh, you know the homology is not such a super fine invariant. So it only sees, you know, for instance, it only can distinguish the homology groups up to homotopy equivalence. So if two uh, topological spaces are homotopy equivalent, they will have the same homology. Well, that comes in a moment. Um, <coughs> so, uh, so that tells us that there's uh, one thing that they are not; they don't contain all the information about. Uh, our spaces. On the other hand, it maybe tells us that they are somehow easier to compute because they only depend on this kind of data. So corollary, um, if x and y are homotopy equivalent, uh, 
uh, then the n homology of x is isomorphic to the n homology of y for all n. What? Can you use this theorem without proof? What does it mean? I mean, to use without proof. You need to give us proof, right? No, I, I, I will. I first give the corollaries, and then I give the proof. Okay? <laughs> to give you some kind of, uh, I mean, you know, you want to know that uh, the, the theorem has some applications. So I first give the applications, and then I give the proof. OK, so I think you can figure out yourself why this is a corollary. You know, you just, uh, you know, you have this, uh, <coughs> if these are homotopy equivalent, you have G and F, so that the composition in one direction is the identity, and the other is the identity. So that precisely means that, uh, uh, <coughs> you know, if you do it for, you get the same thing for the push forward and the, uh, and that's it. So I can maybe make this and if you cannot do this then maybe you should worry a little bit. So <clears throat> the second one is um, which is a special case that if X is contractible, contractible Uh, then we have that hn of x is equal to 0 if n is different from 0. And it's z if n is equal to 0. This is because we know that this is how the, hom the homology of a point is. And if it's contract contractible, it's homotopy equivalent to a point. So therefore, it follows from the previous call. So, and now we want to come to the proof of this theorem. And in order to do this proof, we first again need to go back a little bit to the homological algebra. Maybe I start with a new thing here. So we need some small amount of homological algebra. Again, have to talk about uh, chain complexes and so on. And so, what we want to, what we need now, is a chain homotopy. So, definition. Let um, see, f star and g star from c star d to d star d. So this means at each level we have uh, Fn from Cn to Dn, commuting with Dn, the chain uh, homomorphisms. So that means so we have Cn, we have both Fn and Gn to so Dn for all n commuting with a D. So a chain homotopy from uh, F to G is another sequence of maps which now do not, uh, which go a little bit diagonally. So is a sequence, say maybe I call them Sn from Cn to Dn plus 1, uh, such that then we have this strange formula that somehow interpolates between if we also use the differential, it somehow interpolates between f and g, such that if we take d composed with Sn minus S 
n minus 1 composed with d. This is, see, well now I want it like this, gn minus fn. OK, so let me write this also in diagram form so that you have some, anyway, we can see what our theorem is. <coughs> So we have here, say, have here C n minus one, C n, John one C n plus one, each time D, and um, we have here the same with the D. And now at the, so we can do the following. Oops, I'll write it here. Um, so what is this map? So we have here the map Sn. Here we have the map Sn minus 1. Here we have both the maps Fn and Gn, and now, so this is supposed to be true for all n, obviously. And so now we want that if we do, uh, say, if we first <coughs> go here and then here, and we subtract first going here and then here, we get the difference between these two maps. So. The difference between the two maps, I mean, after all, these are homomorphisms of the abelian group, so I can form the difference. The difference between these two, dif these two maps is the difference between uh, commuting these maps with a differential in the two different ways. So this is a chain homotopy. And uh, <coughs> why would we be, uh, why would this be of any relevance? The point is that. If we have a, the claim obviously is that if you want to use this, that if you have a chain homotopy between uh, two chain maps, then they induce the same homomorphism on the homology. And then we will use this to prove our theorem to show that if we have a homotopy between two maps, then we have a chain homotopy between the induced maps. I mean, between the induced things on the on the chain. So let's see. So we first have to prove this little lemma, which is actually quite trivial. That's one of the, <coughs> it's one of the features of homological algebra that most arguments are extremely simple. It's only that there are very many very simple arguments. So proposition. Let F star and G star be chain homotopic. So from, say, C star to D star, be chain homotopic chain maps. Homotopic chain homomorphisms. Then, well, if I take the map on homology, it's equal. So the given map of homology, is, and you, uh, <coughs> okay, in order to prove this, we have to remember how this map was defined, the induced map. So how was the map given? So F star of uh, the class of, a, of an n cycle alpha. So if alpha is in Zn of uh, C star, then F star of alpha was just the class of 
f n alpha. No? That's how we had to find it. And then one had to see that this is where I defined. So that first, if alpha is a cycle, then f n alpha is a cycle too. And that if one changes alpha by a boundary, then uh, also this gets changed by a boundary. But this is kind of trivial, and we did it. So now we can we want to see that this also that this also works here. So we know what the map is. So let um, so we are here in the proof. So let so alpha is here. So we have if we take alpha in um, so is a class in the nth homology of x. Then we have that alpha is a zero uh, is a zero cycle is n cycle. So that means d of alpha is equal to zero. So now we can try to form the difference between uh, these push forwards by f, uh, the map induced by f on homology and the map induced by g on homology. So if we take f star alpha mean minus g star alpha, what is it? Well, certainly um, we can, you know, by definition, this is the same as putting the fn into this thing. And then it's just, you know, a homomorphism. So we can also take, put the sum into it. So this is the class of fn alpha minus gn alpha. And now we uh, look at this thing. We have our chain homotopy, so we write it down in this form. This is um, D of Sn of alpha minus Sn minus 1 of D of alpha. OK. So alpha is a cycle. So d alpha is 0. So the whole thing is 0. This one is 0. So this is the same as d of Sn of alpha, the class of this. But no, this is d of something. So it is a boundary. So the class of d of something is always 0. Because after all, the homology is precisely given by dividing by the boundary. So we see that the difference between these two is 0. So uh, uh, the maps are the same on homology. So now let me see. It's a bit difficult now. Quarter of an hour, not now one comes to the actual proof of the theorem. So we'll somehow start first with the reduction, which is easy, and then we'll see what we can still do, and at least tell you what the setup is. So now we come to the proof of the theorem. So recall what the theorem is, that if um, we have two homotopic maps, f and g, from x to y, then the induced map on homology is equal. OK, and we want to prove this by eventually constructing a chain homotopy between the indu induced maps on the singular chains. So, But first, we want to make a reduction. to a very special case. Somehow, there's a very simple homotopy between two maps, and it's, in, and it's enough to prove it for this one homotopy. So 
if I take the identity of x times the interval 0, 1. Okay, this is a nice map from x times z. So this I claim is a Hopf property. from uh, between the two maps i0 from x to x times i. If you remember, this was sending x to x comma 0 and between and i1. I mean, this is obvious that this is a homotopy. It's a map. From this, from x times 0, 1 to some space, such that if I restrict it to x times 0, I get uh, uh, i0, and if I restrict it to x times 1, I get i1. Huh? It's trivial. So the claim is, however, that it's enough to prove the theorem for this uh, idiotic case. So assume we know. that I0 star is equal to I1 star as maps from Hn of x to Hn of x times i for all i, for all n. So assume we know our theorem just for the kind of trivial homotopy between these two maps then I claim it holds for every homotopy because we can get every homotopy by composing this thing with a continuous map. So let f from f to g be a homotopy. So where f and g are continuous maps from x to y. Well, then it's not very difficult to see that uh, obviously f is just f composed with i0. g is just f composed with i1. And if you want, f is just f composed with the identity. OK, nobody can doubt that. We don't really need it. So we just obtain our given the homotopy we want just by composing this kind of trivial thing with our given f. And then we can use that homology is functorial so that we have a induced map. So then we get that so then it follows because of the, that F star. So the map on homology induced by F is just F star composed with I0 star. Now as I0 star is the same, you know, I Z <coughs> As I0 star is the same as I1 star, this is the same as F star composed with I1 star. But this is, you know, this is G star. Okay, so we just reduce to this simple case. So thus, <coughs> we note that it is enough to prove the theorem. for uh, I0 and I1. So we want to deal with this case. Uh, and now, yeah, I will start doing the setup. So I somehow, we have to construct our chain homotopy. And we somehow, you know, start with simply singular simplices on X and we have to somehow make out of them sing 
we'll construct from them sequences on x times i. And we somehow do this by taking our simplex, making a, a copy of that same thing, one at zero, one at one, and dividing this thing into simplices and doing something with it. So let me set it up. So on, so now we come to this. So, so on delta n times our interval zero one, we have the following points. We, we write uh, vi equal to ei comma zero. So remember that ei were these points in uh, the, the kind of uh, corners, or however you call them, the vertices of delta n. And uh, wi equal to ei comma one. So that means if we do just the two-dimensional case, we have here, I mean, the, the one-dimensional case, and then times i is two-dimensional. So if we have, so we have here v0, v1, w0, w1. So in this case, we get such a square. But you know, if you have a, another simplex, you know, you would have, um, Anyway, let's first uh, see how it goes on. And now we define for i equals 0 to n, we want to define a singular n plus 1 simplex in delta n plus i. Uh, so we, we put um, so singular n plus 1 simplex in delta n times i as follows. Well, if you remember the notation we used to denote maps, so we take the map uh, w0, w i, then we start with no, v0 to vi, then you start with wi until wn. So this, if you remember, we take a, this by definition is the map which sends the linear combination of the of v0 to the n plus 1, so these are n plus 1 entries, to uh, the corresponding linear combination of these. So that means, um, so this is a map from delta n plus 1 to delta n times i. Maybe I can just uh, write. So if we have, uh, this is the map, which sends uh, sum i equal 0 to n plus 1 ei to times, so ti times ei, where ti are some numbers which add up to 1, uh, to by definition, sum i equal 0. Well, then this cannot be i because we have an i, so I call it k. So k equals 0 to i, uh, t k v k plus sum k equal, how do I want to do it, um, i plus 1 to n plus 1 uh, tk wk minus 1. Okay, so this is the map. Huh? So this is just written out what this is. And so, we <coughs> obviously the image image um, um, what is it um, del uh, is uh, of this map is what I had denoted like this so 
so just the set of all linear combinations of these elements. And um, so if we look at it here, we have, for instance, in this case, we are uh, n is equal to 1. We get two such things. We have uh, the one map which maps the simplex to this thing, and the image is this. And the other one maps the uh, n plus 1, the, the two simplex to this thing, and the image is this in the obvious way. OK? And it's more difficult uh, to imagine if you are in higher dimensions. But anyway, so that's how it looks. Now we want to use this to uh, do something with it. Let me see. I have about two minutes. <clears throat> so maybe I just uh, write down the operator, and then we have to show that this gives us eventually a chain homotopy. So definition. So define the so-called prism operator. So this is P from Cn of x to Cn plus 1 of x. So it should have been called Pn, but I just write P. Um, so I first define it just on simplices, on singular simplices. So for so first I define it for simplex sigma from delta n to x. So simplex, singular simplex. How do I define it? Well, I just write down a formula. So p of sigma is equal to sum i equals 0 to n minus 1 to the i, one always once when one writes formulas, one always wants to sprinkle some signs in it so that afterwards things cancel. Now we take sigma uh, times the identity on i, and we apply this to w0, no, v0 to vi, wi, wn. So we have these uh, uh, simplices, uh, these uh, maps from delta n plus 1 to this thing, to this product. And we apply sigma times the identity to it, which gives me, which gives me a map from, uh, uh, from this uh, delta n plus 1 to uh, x times i. So after all, that's what I wanted. <coughs> and we want to, this should be our. Uh, so this is not composition. What is not composition? Sigma cos 1. No, it might be there's a misprint in the notes. So, so this is not the composition, this is the product. So it's sigma on the, so this is after all we are, uh, it's, it's sigma on the, Delta n, it's the identity on. So, you know, <clears throat> this thing is a map. If you look at this, this is a map from delta n plus 1 to delta n times i. Okay? And now we uh, first do this map. Now we are in delta n plus i times i. And now we apply the sigma on the delta n and the identity on the i. So this is the thing. So if we look at this particular case, we apply, we take this whole thing and we apply to it a sigma times the identity on i to go somewhere. To go finally to uh, x times i. Um, and we take here, we take it with a positive sign, and here we take it with a negative sign. And this has the nice effect that if you look at this thing, you have one plus, one minus, so you can hope that the 
in the middle it somehow will cancel. That's why one has this sign. Okay, and so then the claim, which will prove the theorem, is that P from I0 to, so P is a chain homotopy from uh, from say I zero star from C star of X to C star of X times I to I one star okay, that's the claim and that's the thing we really have to prove but then if we have proven the claim it follows, so then the theorem follows. Because if we have a chain homotopy between these two, this means they induce the same map on homology. So thus, because then I0 star is equal to I1 star on homology. All n. Okay. Okay. So maybe here I stop. So now uh, next time we, I will repeat the setup, and then uh, we will have to prove this claim. And with this, we uh, will have proven the theorem. Okay. Thank you very much. <laughs>